We're kind of asking a, a, a bit of a provocatively phrased question here. The question is, what's the deal with church? Because I'm just going to kind of shoot straight with you here at the outset. Church makes a lot of sense and is a really happy, normal place for people who grew up and who are accustomed to going to church, right? And uh, even for some who didn't grow up going to church, you can sort of acclimate and kind of get a feel for the shape of the thing and how things are done and, and all of that. But, but for many people, a great many people, the whole concept of church, the whole idea of the church is just a bit off-putting. It, it feels surreal and, and not really connected to their life or, or to reality, at least reality as they perceive it in general. And I'm just wondering how many of you have, have ever had the experience where someone has said to you, or maybe you yourself have said, I, I don't believe in organized religion. Have you heard that before? before? By the way, a great little comeback to that is, well, do you believe in disorganized religion? <laughs> but uh, if, if, the purpose, if the purpose is to actually make communication and not just get into an argument, don't say that. Um, but, but when people are saying that they don't believe in, in organized religion, what they're often saying, and we need to hear this, it's a legitimate, uh, uh, it's a legitimate uh, observation, and that is that there's something about the way that church is done that just feels a bit disconnected. It, it, it doesn't feel as integrated with life as, as maybe it should be. And I'm just going to shoot straight with you here. What we're going to discover is that the church has one major problem, but that one major problem has spawned lots and lots of other problems. And the major problem is that the church has been wildly and significantly, and you could even say ubiquitously, infiltrated by tradition. And uh, therefore, it becomes very difficult for people. And by the way, this applies to all churches. And some of you are sitting there thinking, does he mean my church? Your church too. Um, what ends up happening with, with the various churches, whether the Baptist or the Catholic or the Orthodox or the Adventist or whatever, is that people have sometimes a difficult time distinguishing between what's the actual biblical context of the church and what's the stuff that this is just the way we do it. Do, do you hear what I'm saying? And some people think, no, this is the way we've done it. We've always done it this way. It's the organ, it's stained glass windows, it's pews, it's steeples, and that's the way church works. It's fine and good for you to feel that way, but you're going to have a hard time finding any of those things in the Bible, right? Nothing about an organ, nothing about pews, nothing about church steeples, or nothing about wearing suits and ties, or even standing behind pulpits, or even the idea of the church as a building. All of that is a very, well, not very modern, but a modern concept when compared to Scripture. And so the tricky part is that for many people who are outside of the church, and even for some of us who are in the church, we love what the church stands for, we love the communion, we love the community and the connection and all of those things, but, but there's something about church that, that feels maybe doesn't perfectly resonate with you. Well, well the good news is, is that we're going to see that, that we can have our own little idiosyncratic or unique way, cultural way of doing church, and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way, but we want to be very careful that we make a clear line of distinction between the actual biblical text and data about what the church is and just our own way of doing it, whether in America or in Jamaica or here in the East or here in the West or with the white people or with the Indian people or with the black people or with the whatever. Are you with me on that? Because people are different. Have you noticed that? They, they look different. They talk different. They eat different. They, 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 li they live different. And it's not surprisingly then when you get different groups of different people together that they're going to do church a little different. Now, as long as the way that we do church is not out of harmony with what Scripture says, everything is fine. So far, so good. But for some, there's always going to be a bit of a disconnect, a bit of a, I, I don't really feel like I belong in a church, and, and how can I connect with a church? And my burden increasingly is, is for people to really be connected with the message of the church, with the content of the church, and with the people of the church. Do you feel that? Not necessarily with this is the way that we do things and our way is the right way and it's the only way and that church down the street is doing things the wrong way. Now with this sort of in, in mind, we're asking the question here, okay, what's the deal with church? What is the church really all about? And in order to do that, we're going to have to spend some time sort of coming face to face with, with the good parts of church and the bad parts of church, the things that we're doing well and the things that we're not doing so well. 
Um, one of my favorite quotations about the church is from none other than Gandhi, in which he said, um, quite perspicaciously, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. They are so unlike your Christ. Right? And that's a legitimate complaint. I mean, I'll be totally honest with you. I find myself distanced from and disassociated with a great many things that are called Christian. Right? I think, well, it, oh, really, that's Christian? Well, then I don't know. Okay, then am, am I a Christian? Or is that really Christian? Because many of the things that are labeled as Christian, whether by marketers or by uh, well-meaning people or other things, I don't resonate with. Right? Some so-called Christian values are not values that I hold to. I'd rather hold to biblical values. What does the text of Scripture say rather than Christian as defined by some marketing group, some contemporary church, or uh, by um, uh, you know, some religious right organization? I just want to know what the text of Scripture says. Are you with me on that? Another way of saying that is basically this. I would rather know what the text of Scripture says and what I believe and then go try and find a body of people that also believe that and that agree with that rather than finding a church that I just happen to like or to fit into and then hope that they also teach the Word. No, 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 no. I'm going to start with the Word and then go find a church rather than starting with the church and then hoping that they preach the Word. Amen. And so I think Gandhi's point is a valid one here. There are a great many things that are called Christian um, that are labeled Christian that may or may not be. The call on my life and the call on your life is not just to be a Christian in name, but to really be... Christ people on earth, to be the kinds of people that are bringing the kingdom of God, whether to our office or to our university classroom or to our neighborhood, our home, etc. So far, so good? Okay, great. Now, we're going to ask the question, kind of what happened to the church? In our next three presentations, um, the one that we're doing now and then the next two, we're going to address the second, to, the second and third of these topics here. But we're going, to, we're going to take a look at the loss of the Sabbath. That's one significant difference that if you're going to really hold most modern churches to the standard of the text of Scripture, you're going to be in a bit of a pickle because most modern churches go to church on Sunday. That is the, the first day of the week. And yet the Bible says nothing about going to church on Sunday. And as we learned in our last presentation, it has a lot to say about the significance and the relational um, uh, significance of the Sabbath. And uh, so that's a big one right there. And we're going to talk about, okay, well, how did that happen? What what happened to the Sabbath? How, did the church just, just change its mind about that? Does the church even, church even have a right to change its mind about that? Um, we're also then going to talk about the adoption of the immortality of the soul and how Greek thinking came increasingly into the church and what the uh, implications and ramifications of that Greek thinking are. And then we'll talk about uh, uh, the perversion of the teaching of hell, which is one of the um, most... Uh, one of the saddest chapters in, in all of modern Christianity is the basic picture that, that many of them, most Christians have of hell, and then, of course, the picture that that paints of God, which is fundamentally incompatible with what we've been learning in our seminar here, which is that what? God is love. Now, that's still two presentations out, so we're not going to talk about that right here. But we are going to talk about what happened to the church just in general. And in order to do that, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about prophecy. Now, we've just mentioned prophecy in a, in a past presentation, but I'll just remind us that, that a prophecy is a foretelling by God of future events, okay? And there are both Old Testament prophecies and New Testament prophecies, but they all basically mean the same thing. Telling in advance not what might happen, not a prediction of what could happen, but a declaration of what will happen. Here in Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10, I really like this passage of Scripture because in the first verse, verse 9, God basically says, I'm God, no one else is God. And then in verse 10, he says, I'll prove it. I'll show you that I'm God and no one else is God. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Well, how do we know that you're God and what makes you uniquely God? And then he says, declaring the end from the beginning... And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel will stand and I will do all my pleasure. God here essentially says, I can reveal the future accurately and consistently, consistently, and in so doing, you can know that I am a, not a natural being, but a supernatural being. I have access to information that, that you don't. Jesus in the New Testament said it even more succinctly. He said, and now, John 14, 29, he says, and now, present tense, I have told you before, that's history, it comes to pass that when it does come to pass, the future you might believe, right? So, so the key words here are 
before and believe. Jesus says, I'll tell you in advance what's going to happen, the way that it's going to happen, and this particular one is in reference to his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, he says, I'll tell you in advance what's going to happen, and when it comes to pass, like I said, then you can believe that everything else I'm telling you is also true. And that's the basic uh, logic behind the concept of prophecy. Prophecy is history in advance. It is a foretelling of future events. Biblical prophecy is not a prediction by a man, but a declaration by God. Now, I want to say something here. We made this, the, the point a couple presentations ago when we talked about did Jesus actually live that the Christian faith being an historical faith is vulnerable. It, it's what, everyone? It's vulnerable because it basically says our theological content, what makes, what makes up the data, the package of Christianity, is tied to historical events. Thus, if those historical events didn't happen, then our data is vacuous. And, th and that's a bit of a risky proposition, right? And Christianity, as it were, has its neck on the chop chopping block, basically saying, yes, Jesus, there was a man named Jesus. Yes, he lived. Yes, he taught those things. Yes, he was buried. Yes, yes, he was crucified. Yes, he was buried. And yes, he rose again. Those are all historical claims, right? If those historical claims could, show, could be shown to be false, then, then I would walk out of this room right now. I wouldn't even finish taping. Right? There'd be no point. What would be the point to be here talking about Christ and all of these great things in the Christian Bible if, if those events upon which the whole thing is built hadn't happened? Well, there's another sense in which the Bible is both, in which Christianity is both exceedingly vulnerable but exceedingly strong. And it's at this point, it makes predictions, right? It makes predictions or at least it makes declarations about events that are yet to happen. That's what a prophecy is. So the Bible says, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. And Jesus says, when I tell you before it comes to pass, when it comes like I said, you can believe. But what if one of the things that was promised or, or anticipated in Scripture didn't come to pass as God said it would, provided all the conditions were met? Well, again, here, the Christian faith would be on the chopping block. It's vulnerable. But this point of vulnerability is actually a point of significant strength because if God says in advance, this is what will happen, this is what will happen, this is what will happen, and then that does come to happen, and he says it well in advance of the things that he's describing, well, then, man, that's like faith bolstering. Are you with me on that? This is one of the things that initially attracted me 17 years ago to um, the Christian faith. It was this beautiful picture of, of history in advance. God says, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. Well, one of the pictures that we have in the Old Testament, particularly in the book of Daniel, and also in the New Testament, several books in the New Testament, the Gospels, Acts, Thessalonians, the Epistles of John, and also Revelation, is we're given a basic trajectory Okay, a basic what, everyone? A basic trajectory, which means a direction based on previous points, right? So if you're going here and you're going here, the trajectory will be like this. If you're going here and you're going here, the trajectory, you sort of extrapolate out based on what has happened before. And we are actually told in Scripture itself what the trajectory of the church would be. It's remarkable. All the way back as far as the book of Daniel, we're basically given this picture of, of how the church will proceed from apostolic times onward. And the church, of course, was formed. You can sort of just go through the, the four words here. It's very simple. It's church history in like 30 seconds. The church was formed over time, and this is what we're going to talk about here. The church became deformed. That deformation became so far removed from the original intent and the formation that people protested, and the church was called to reform and that process of reforming the church will eventually result in the complete restoration of the apostolic church. So there's church history in 30 seconds. The church was formed, it was deformed, it was reformed, and it is being restored. So far, so good? Now, the cool thing is, is that this is not just a description of what has happened. It's a prescription of what God said would happen well in advance. Think of it a bit like an airplane right? The airplane is, is on the, the, the tarmac there. It's, you know, received clearance to take off. And on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, the church was really launched there. You could go back and say, well, the church began with the disciples, and certainly it did. But, but the real birth uh, day of the church, and I'm not being absolutely, you know, precise about this, but in general, 3,000 people were baptized on the day of Pentecost, and the Bible says that the last part of Acts uh, chapter 2, it says, and the Lord added to the church those that were being saved. 
And so here the church goes from a small sort of ragtag band of, you know, just less than 100 people uh, that were in the upper room praying, and all of a sudden there's thousands of them. And then as the book of Acts continues to go, 4,000 are baptized later, several more thousand are baptized, and so the church begins to grow. But as the church sort of grows, not just in the first century, but into the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth centuries and beyond, imagine the church a bit like an airplane. Okay, a what, everyone? And an airplane. So in the air, everything is looking good. You know, it's on the runway. All is well. The pilot has done the walk around. They're cleared for landing. Air traffic control is given in the go-ahead. And so the church begins to take off. And as the church speeds down the runway and begins to take off, everything is looking great. Right? Now, by way of analogy, the day of Pentecost has come. The Holy Spirit is poured out. And the church is apparently soaring to glory. Everything is going to be great. And it is really great for the first century and even for most of the second century. But as early as the middle to the end of the second century and as well into the third and fourth, the things begin to, to wobble and a problem with the engine over here. And, and now the church is having trouble um, maintaining the altitude that it had gained when things were well. Let's say it got up to 10,000 feet or 5,000 feet. Now it's sort of 10,000, sort of stabilizing at 10, oh, dropping down sort of 9, sort of 8, sort of, and it's looking really bad, 6, 5,000, 4,000, you know, buckle your safety belts, the oxygen masks are dropping, etc. And it, it really has to go into a situation where there is a virtual crash, and that's where the analogy kinds of break, kind of breaks, da breaks down. Because what happens with the church is that it quite literally, uh, literally is the wrong word, it, it, it actually basically crashes. It becomes so far removed from what was originally intention that when the reformers start calling for reformation, that's why they were called the reformers, you had to almost start from scratch. Now, they didn't believe that. The Martin Luthers and the John Calvins and others, they at one point believed, the William Tyndales of the world, they thought that the church could be reformed and reconfigured and we can just make a few changes here and there. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I just want to give you the overall picture first. But the truth of the matter was is they had to start from scratch. And a whole new church, a whole new plane, as it were, was birthed. And that new plane was what we think of as Protestantism that has just grown from strength to strength from strength until we find ourselves today in 2013. So it's the analogy of the plane. The what, everyone? Plane. It starts off and it's looking good. And it gets up to about 10,000 feet. But rather than continuing to soar 20,000, 30,000 and getting right up to cruising altitude, it begins to encounter troubles, problems, can't even maintain what it was, and then uh, begins to go down. So the trajectory of the church looks like this. And it doesn't happen again. You don't have to get to the 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th centuries and beyond. No, it begins to happen literally in the century immediately after the death of the apostles. The thing starts to get shaky early on, and I want to tell you that story. Now, the cool thing is, is that in telling you this story, I'm actually telling you a story that the Bible told well in advance of the events that, that it describes. And in order to do that, we're actually going to sort of go back and uh, just quickly review two prophecies. Now, under normal circumstances, if this were a full prophecy seminar and I was going through the various prophecies of Daniel and of Revelation, we'd spend a lot of time going through Daniel chapter 2, point by point, verse by verse, so you'd get it. We'd go through Daniel 7, point by point, verse by verse, so to 8, so to 9, some of 10, maybe even some 11, certainly 12. And then we'd go to Revelation. We'd spend a lot of time there. We don't have that luxury here, and that's not the full purpose of this seminar. We're asking questions like, what is the Bible? Does God exist? Why do children suffer? What's the deal with church? But in order to answer the question, what's the deal with church, I need to give sort of a 15 to 20 minute sort of synopsis of two of the major prophecies in the Old Testament. And they're found in the book of Daniel. Um, very quickly here in Daniel chapter 2, uh, a king, the king of Babylon, has a dream. And in that dream, he basically sees a giant metal man, which we have an artist's depiction of here. And uh, the metal man has a head of gold. It has a chest and arms that are made of silver. The long leg, or excuse me, the, the, the midsection is made of bronze or brass. The long legs are made of iron, and the feet are made of iron and clay, which is what you see here. Gold, silver, bronze, iron, iron and clay. Now, in the, the story of Daniel chapter 2 and in the unpacking of Daniel chapter 2, what's, what's taking place here is actually quite remarkable. It's, it's a history in advance of... Uh, the, the area in and around where Daniel lived from his time onward. 
Uh, and if time allowed, I could show you that it begins with the head of gold, which is Babylon. Then it moves to Medo-Persia. Then it goes to the, to the kingdom of Greece. And then from Greece to Rome, finally to the division of Rome, and then the setting up of God's own kingdom. And that becomes a critical sort of line of, of uh, a historical line for understanding how these prophecies are going to go. From Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, the division of Rome, God setting up his own kingdom. Okay? Now, the next prophecy that comes is Daniel chapter 7. This is the second prophecy we've got to kind of understand. And here, God gives the same basic line of, of history, the same basic flow of the nations. Again, now remember, this is well in advance of the events it's describing. Um, the, the book of Daniel was written sort of five, almost 600 years before the time of Jesus. And just take, for example, the, the dissolution of the Roman Empire takes place in AD 476. So that's more than 1,000 years later. Okay, so, so the events that are being described here are being described in advance. It's miraculous. It's supernatural. Okay, now there are people that don't believe it's miraculous, and I'll tell you just very quickly what they say, and then I'll give you a really good response to it. But in Daniel chapter 7 here, rather than dealing with a metal man, we have these sort of kind of weird beasts. And uh, in the, the first case, we have a lion with eagle's wings. That's, that's Babylon that corresponds to the head of gold. In the second case, we have Daniel sees a bear that, that comes up out of the waters. And uh, that bear is sort of hunched up on one side, has three ribs in the mouth, which you can kind of make out there. And that corresponds to uh, the chest and arms of silver, which is the Medo-Persian Empire. That's followed by the four-headed leopard with four wings uh, with the belly and thighs of bronze, which is none other than Greece. And here's one of those little spots where Bible prophecy is really remarkable. Because... Uh, after the death of Alexander the Great, at the young age of sort of 31 or 32, Alexander the Great's empire was really uh, perplexed about what to do because there was no person that was charismatic or, or strong enough to sort of take over where Alexander the Great had left off. I mean, they didn't call him Alexander the Great for nothing. So what actually happened to the Greek um, empire was that it was divided into four parts. And uh, those four parts were given to the, the various generals of Alexander after his death, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. And one went to the north, one to the south, one to the east, and one to the west. And here's a remarkable thing. Right in the prophecy of Daniel, here's this four-headed leopard. Well, why four, four heads? Well, that will become... The, 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 well, anybody observing that on the face of it would say, oh, well, it's four heads because of the four generals. Then you have this sort of ferocious, terrible beast. And Daniel just describes it as, as a... As a as a nondescript, ferocious, terrible, bruising, crushing beast. He doesn't even really tell us what it is. We don't know what it is. And so this is an artist's depiction that corresponds to the long legs of iron, none other than Rome. But here's where things get really fascinating. Just as the, the metal statue had feet that were made of iron and clay and on the feet, of course, ten toes... This ferocious, terrible beast of Rome has ten horns. Now, of course, that's unlike any beast in the wild. You know, a, a, a deer will have two antlers, or a, a ram will have uh, two horns. You know, two. Even the fabled unicorn had just one. But no beast in the wild uh, has ten horns. And so this is a remarkable thing here. Well, those ten horns correspond to the ten toes, and they're none other than the nations of divided Rome. You see, Rome wasn't, divide, Rome wasn't conquered like the nations before it. See, uh, Babylon was conquered by Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia was conquered by Greece. Greece was conquered by Rome. Rome, though, was not conquered by a more powerful or mighty empire. In fact, it was divided. And that's exactly what the prophecy says. It's just remarkable when you study Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. And it's one of my favorite things to talk about is, is Bible prophecy. Now, I'm just going to pause right here for a moment and say... But somebody's bound to say, but how do you know that the book of Daniel was written? I mean, if the book of Daniel was really written some five or 600 years before the time of Jesus, that would make this supernatural. But there is no God, and I don't believe in supernatural things. Or maybe you could just say, I'm questioning supernatural things. So how can that be true? It must have been written later, and you were, you were correct. That's exactly the objection that's raised. People say the book of Daniel must have been written at a later date. But here's where things get tricky for people that make that objection. One of the reasons they get tricky is that you can't put the book of Daniel too much later than the traditional authorship of about 500 years before the time of Jesus because of two major reasons. One of which is Jesus in the New Testament, so that's right at the turn of the century, quotes from the book of Daniel as an earlier authoritative source. Right? So Jesus actually says in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 24, he says, when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, 
stand in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, here's the point. If you have Jesus in, say, AD 30, right? At the turn of the century, if you have Jesus quoting Daniel as authoritative, and by the way, the Jews took their canon of Scripture very seriously. You weren't going to slide a new book in or take one out to the Jewish nation. I mean, this was their life, the, the written word of God and the Torah. So if you have Jesus at the turn of the century quoting Daniel as an earlier authoritative source, what that does is, is that means that that book could not have been, I mean, by any conservative standards, even being very gracious and elastic, could not have been any younger than 200 years before the time of Jesus. Okay? Now, here's another little interesting line of evidence. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1947, and the Dead Sea Scrolls were basically an ancient library which contained uh, much of the Old Testament scriptures. One of the books that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are dated to sometime not older than 200 B.C., but not younger than about 100 B.C., so again, that's about the same time frame, 200 to 100 years before the time of Jesus, the book of Daniel is found there. Now, now here's the really cool thing. Let's just say that the hardened skeptic says, no, the book of Daniel must have been written after the events it describes. It couldn't possibly have been that accurate. Well, here's the fascinating point. Think about the prophecy again. Babylon, Medo-Persia, the prophecies, Greece, Rome, the division of Rome, right? Now, it even in, in the other prophecy there in, in the metal man, it says that when Rome is divided, they'll try to get Rome back together by intermarriage and by other means, but it won't work. Now, here's a fascinating thing. Even if you say that the book of Daniel was written as late as 200 B.C., right? 200 B.C., let's just be really generous to the skeptics. Well, you still have to do Rome conquering Greece, and you could maybe make a case for that, but then you have 500 years yet future in AD 26, the division of Rome. Good luck with that one. And not just the division of Rome, down here you have that efforts would be made to bring unity to Rome by marital and military means, and that those would prove ultimately unsuccessful. So no matter how you slice the pie, you either have like six or seven predictive elements, or you have three or four predictive elements. No matter what you do, the book of Daniel is a remarkable, incomparable uh, commentary on biblical prophecy. It basically says, hey, look, these things are going to happen, and even the hardest, most, most committed of skeptics can't get the book of Daniel any later than about 200 years before the time of Jesus. But there's still a lot of prediction that comes after. Does this make sense, everyone? Awesome stuff. Now, back to what happened to the church. That was just a little parenthetical statement to talk about sort of how can we be sure that these prophecies are real? How can we be sure somebody's not just pulling the wool over our eyes? And by the way, I've read both critical and positive commentaries on the book of Daniel. I've looked at the best arguments for and against, and I'm telling you, the book of Daniel withstands the scrutiny that has been placed upon it. It's just amazing, and, and as does the rest of Scripture. Well, here's kind of the cool thing. In, in this particular prophecy of the, of the animals that come up, the lion and the bear and the leopard and this terrible beast and then the horns, it says something very interesting. And I'm just going to go to the passage and sort of read it to you here. I'm going to go to Daniel chapter 7. And uh, you can either just sort of listen along or you can uh, follow along. And I just want to remind you here again that I'm giving you the really quick version, not because uh, uh, of any reason other than I just need to provide this background to get to the real point I want to get to. So let me just read to you about this little horn, okay? I'll pick it up in verse 7, Daniel chapter 7, verse 7. Daniel says, After this I saw in my night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth, which corresponds with the iron legs, of course. Huge iron teeth, devouring, and it was devouring and breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with the feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had... What does your Bible say? It had ten horns. ten horns. There's the ten horns we were talking about. Now watch this. Daniel says in verse 8, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up from among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. Jump down to verse 11. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning flame. Now I'm going to read you another uh, couple of verses here about the career of this little horn that comes up out of the head of this fourth terrible beast. We'll pick it up in verse 20. 
and the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, before whom three fell, namely that horn that had eyes like uh, that had eyes and a mouth, and spoke here it is a third time now, pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. Verse 21, I was watching, and that same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Now, two final verses here. Verse 23 again, uh, we'll do 23, 24, and 25. Three verses here in this chapter. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth and trample it and break it into pieces. The ten horns are ten what? Kings or kingdoms that will arise from this kingdom. In other words, from divided Rome. Well, that's exactly what we saw in the image of Daniel 2. The long legs of iron eventually went into the divided kingdoms of uh, the, the ten toes. It says, who will arise from this kingdom, and then another will arise after them. He will be different from the first ones. He will subdue three kings, and he will speak, here it is a fourth time now, pompous words against the Most High. He will, here's a second time, persecute the saints of the Most High and will intend to change times and laws. The saints will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Okay, so basically, even if you know nothing about this imagery, you know nothing about Daniel chapter 7, you know nothing about this little horn, all you have to read is those verses to know, this guy's a pretty bad dude, right? Like, he speaks pompous words, pompous words, pompous words, pompous words, four times against the Most High. He makes war against God's own people, and he even starts changing God's times and laws. Now, that is why, when we come to the New Testament, this power is referred to as the Antichrist. That's the term that John uses, the Antichrist. Uh, Paul calls him the man of sin, and uh, uh, John, in the book of Revelation, calls him the beast. These are not complementary terms, right? Oh, yeah, he's, he's the Antichrist. He's a beast. He's the man of sin. He's a little horn. These are all, like, really non-complementary terms because this guy is basically waging, this power is basically waging significant war against God and his people. Well, here's a kind of interesting little uh, pictorial, um, a, a couple pictures, a little uh, um, pictorial survey of a building in Germany, strangely enough, in Nuremberg, Germany, the Rathaus, which is kind of like the city council building. And uh, a good friend of mine, Chad Cruiser, actually took these pictures. And you can see this is the, the, one of the doors at the Rathaus. And what you have is a man and a man. And then you have a beast and a beast. But when we zoom up on this, these statues that are over the top of this door, what we see here is a Babylonian-ish type figure. And in the background, a lion with eagle's wings. Very interesting. This is exactly the prophecy from Daniel chapter 2, or Daniel chapter 7. And then we go look at the other side, and we see a Persian figure right? A Persian type figure and a bear, and it's very difficult to see here in this lighting, but uh, on the full photograph, the bear has three ribs coming out of the mouth, just exactly like Daniel chapter 7 says. Well, now we go to the other door, and the other door also has two figurines and two animal figures, and here we have none other than a Greek figure, perhaps even Alexander the Great himself, and behind him, a four-headed leopard. Now, I tried to figure out exactly when this building was built, and to the best of my ability, it was built sometime in the 15th or 16th century. And so what I'm showing you here is this isn't something that David just invented. I didn't just come up with this on the spot in 2000. No, this has been a time-honored interpretation of this prophecy. This, frankly, the reason it's time-honored is that it's inescapably clear. But I'm just showing you here that, that this is exactly what the sculptor that put these figurines over the doors at the Rathaus in Nuremberg was trying to show you. So here's this four-headed leopard. Where well, here's really interesting. Here's a Roman soldier over the other side of the door, and there's a almost half dog, half bear looking strange beast. And it looks like he has a pineapple growing out of his head, <laughs> right? But it's not a pineapple, it's 10 horns. And if you look really carefully, you'll see there's a little, almost what looks like a pine cone on one of the horns. Do you see that? If you zoom up on that with a high definition DSLR camera, it's a face. It's a face. It's a little head. It's a face. And it's describing the very thing we just read in Daniel chapter 7. A ferocious beast with ten horns. That's Rome. Ten horns divided into a variety of kingdoms. And one of them was a different kind of kingdom that was a persecuting power, that was a blasphemous power, and that was a power that reigned for a significant period of time. Now, Right at this point, we need to sort of pan out a little bit and remind ourselves of some of the things that Daniel 7 and 8, we're not going to spend any time in Daniel 8. You can read it on your own or you can just trust me on this one. These are the things that the, the prophecy says that this little horn will do. 
It will persecute the church. We just read that together. Persecute the saints. It speaks blasphemy against God. We just read that four times. Pompous, 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 pompous. It changes God's times and laws. That's Daniel 7. In Daniel 8, which if time allowed, we could go to Daniel chapter 8 and see that the career of this little horn power is also described there. It persecutes the church. It exalts himself as Jesus Christ. It undermines Jesus' high priestly ministry. And even, it says, it casts the truth down to the ground. Now, what emerges in this picture is basically that this power is a religious power, not merely a national power, but a religious power because it does religious things, very religious things. Now, with that sort of backdrop in mind of Daniel, and let me just quickly remind us of it so that it's right clear in our minds. You go from Babylon to Medo-Persia, Medo-Persia to Greece, Greece to Rome. Rome was divided, and out of the nations of divided Rome, now remember that's after 476 A.D., A.D. 476, in the 5th century, Rome is divided, and today what we call divided Rome is Europe. Right? There's England and there's France and there's Germany and there's Switzerland and there's Spain and there's Portugal. That's divided Europe. Right? That is the Europe empire fragmented into bits. And of course, the Roman empire fragmented into bits. And of course, the Roman empire extended further to the east, but that's been sort of gobbled up by Islam. And it also extended somewhat to the south down into what we'd call the north of Africa, but that has really ceased to be part of the Roman empire. But even today, there are... I mean, if you've done any traveling at all in Italy or in, in anywhere in Western Europe, I mean, the whole thing is clearly, um, uh, you just have this, this remarkable evidence after evidence after evidence after evidence that this is the fragmented Roman Empire. We call it Europe. Europe is actually kind of an interesting word. It comes from Europe, which means wide gaze, wide gaze, like from the optic nerve, Europe. Optic nerve. So basically, it was the land over there just taking in a vast panorama. What used to be the Western Roman Empire was, is now fragmented into what we call Europe, the wide panorama, Europe. Okay, now here's kind of some interesting things. One of the primary figures in the development of Europe and in the development of the division of Rome is none other than the church itself. The church itself, and this is where the, the prophecies get really interesting because this is where the plane starts to encounter difficulties. The church begins to take off and it looks really good into the first, even the beginning of the second century. But as soon as we get into the third and fourth centuries, things begin to happen that cause the church, the plane, to have significant turbulence. And some of those things were, were persecuting type things, things that were against the church, such as some of the early Roman emperors, not early, they were actually later, but early in terms of the church, Domitian, Diocletian, and Decian and others who actually persecuted the church. But the persecution was actually easy for the church to bear relative to what was coming. And what was coming was actually not more intense persecution against the church by the Romans, it was the exact opposite. In fact, an early historian, Tertullian, remarked that the blood of martyrs, the blood of Christian martyrs, is the seed of the church. When the, when the Christian martyrs would be hewn down, as it were, in these uh, persecutions, and it wasn't just ongoing, uninterrupted persecution. There were periods. It was episodic of persecution. But when that would happen, it would actually, in a kind of strange way, it would publish the Christian faith. Right? When, when the Christians were, were put into the Colosseums or when they were burned at the stake or, or tortured in public settings, with their calmness, with their poise, with their dignity, and with their confidence in Christ, they actually got the opportunity to advertise the Christian faith. And it was that, among other things, that caused the Christian faith to begin to grow. And that's why Tertullian said, man, the blood of the martyrs is seed. You kill one and ten more come up. You kill ten and a hundred more come up. But all of that persecution, as bad as it was and as bad as it seemed, pressing against the church, the church actually became stronger and stronger and stronger until we get to the beginning of the 4th century. And at the beginning of the 4th century, in AD 312, a most remarkable thing happens, and I don't have time to develop all of the political and, and uh, all of the reasons that this ended up happening, but the emperor of Rome, Constantine, converts to the Christian faith. Well, this was just completely unanticipated, unheard of impossibly difficult to predict that the leader of Rome, Rome, which has been an empire now for almost 600 years and historically a pagan empire, Rome, you know, worshiping either the sun and then in later years the emperor himself, he's going to convert to Christianity. Now you have to understand to really appreciate the, the unlikeliness of, of the Constantine converting. You have to appreciate that, that 
in the minds of most Romans, uh, especially in the, in the second and third centuries, the Christians were just a sect of Judaism, and the Romans hated the Jews, right? The Jews were considered a primitive, backward, superstitious, weird people, which is why the Romans and the Jews were always like this, right? And so in Roman thinking, Christians are just Jews, but like different. Yeah, they're Jews that believe that Jesus has come, but they're still largely Jews. But as the church began to grow, it was growing among the Jewish population, but it especially began to grow increasingly among the Gentile populations, primarily among the poor, by the way. That's another story. But as, as it became a, a larger part of the empire, now, in a best-case scenario, the Christians would have constituted maybe 3% of the Roman Empire, very small percentage, 2 to 3%. But something remarkable happens. After the conversion of Constantine, within 20 years, okay, let this sink in, within 20 years after the conversion of Constantine in AD 312, the, the, the Christian church goes from being between 3, 2%, not more than 4% of the Roman Empire, to being over 60% of the Roman Empire. So for in, in 20 years, you go from being a, an intensely persecuted Jewish minority, Right? to now being a politically active, overwhelming majority, and it happens in two decades. Now, is that going to have huge implications for the church? Oh, man, does it ever. And the implications are not only huge, they're terrible. And the, the bottom line basically ends up being that all of the Roman traditions come rushing, and many of them pagan traditions, come rushing in the form of these new Christians into the church. And, and many, a story, many an historian has noted that the church could survive persecution, but could it survive popularity? Ooh, let that one sink in, right? The church could survive persecution, but could it survive popularity? And the answer is it struggled with popularity because it sure looked like the kingdom of God had come and Constantine believed that among other things God had raised him up to bring unity to the Christian church. But now a variety of things begin to happen that I'm just going to go through in very quick detail. In AD 330, Constantine moves the seat of the Western Roman Empire from Rome to Constantinople, the city of Constantine, which we today call Istanbul. I was just there recently. And uh, when he moves the seat of his empire, he has to leave somebody in charge. Somebody is left as the primary civil figure. Because by, the, by this time, by the way, if you're paying any attention to the chronology, AD 330 is less than 150 years removed from AD 476. And that's going to be the end of the Western Roman Empire. Rome was already beginning to feel the stretch and the tension of an empire that was crumbling. It was already beginning to happen. And so uh, that's why many historians believe that Constantine's conversion was not genuine. It was a, it was a desperation move to try to bring some religious... Uh, uh, adherency, some religious cohesiveness to keep his empire together. But watch what happens. When he moves his empire in AD 330, the seat of his empire over to Constantinople, he then leaves a power vacuum in Rome, and that power vacuum is basically handed over to, I need a, there's a slide I'm going to need here. That one, right there. He basically leaves um, the bishop of Rome in charge. The bishop of the Christian church is left in charge. But now he's not just a religious figure. Watch what happens. The Bishop of Rome becomes a religio-political figure because he's, he's not only religious, he's now the civil authority as well. Now, other things are happening within the Christian church that I don't really have time to develop here, but basically what you had was a three-way tie, a three-way competition would be a better way to say it, between three major branches of Christianity. You had the eastern version of Christianity, which was Jerusalem and Antioch. You had the southern version, which was the north of Africa and Alexandria. And you had the north and the western version, which was Rome. And through a series of events that I'm not going to go into right now, Rome slowly but surely began to win that tug of war in the third and fourth centuries. And by the time Constantine is converted, Rome just whoo, pulls the rope away. Right Now what happens is exactly the thing that Lord Acton anticipated in our earlier presentation. Power, what does it do? What does power do? It tends to corrupt. But what does absolute power do? It corrupts absolutely. And here is one of the most remarkable plot twists in all of history. The enemy of the church is the church. 
The very anti-Christian power that we just read all those gnarly things about. You're like, ooh, who's the, the boogeyman is in the closet. Who's that guy? Who's the guy that's so brave he dares to speak words against God and he even persecutes God's people? I want to stay away from him. Do you know who it is? It's the church. I mean, one of the greatest plot twists in all of, of modern history is that the enemy of the church is none other than the church. The church itself, the medieval church, becomes the Antichrist. The church itself wages war against anyone who didn't abide by their increasingly superstitious and pagan-defined doctrine. And that's, that's basically what happened. Here we go. The church is taking off. But we begin to encounter a little bit of turbulence. And by the time we get to the conversion of Constantine, uh-oh, this is not good. So many new people rush into the church with all their pagan ideas and pagan symbols and pagan ceremonies and pagan thinking, right, that it begins to really totter. Constantine moves the seat of his empire over there, which creates a power vacuum. And somebody gets on the controls of the plane and says, I can fly this thing. But now watch what happens. I said just 150 years later is AD 476. Well, let me ask you a simple question. After the demise of the Western Roman Empire in AD 476, what do you think would become the single strongest unifying element in Europe, Western Europe, or divided Rome? What would be the only thing that was kind of somewhat cohesive, keeping things cohesively together? It's no longer a governmental system. What is it now? It's a church. It's a religion. And that religion comes to be called the Roman church, right? It's, the, it's Rome's church now that's going to kind of keep the thing going. The problem is, is rather than going back to Scripture and what does the text say, the, and this is the story of much, much of Western Christianity, their own sense of power and pride and prestige only filled them more and more with a sense that we are God's church. We're God's people, and this results in an attitude of persecution. This results in, in an, uh, an attitude of superstition. The word, to, to give you the very brief version here, the word of man is increasingly elevated, the place of man, the position of man, the prominence of man, and so you get priests and bishops and archbishops and cardinals and prelates and even finally a pope. Just ch -ch 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 -ch. this whole hierarchy of the importance of man, a whole edifice to man's ways and man's ideas and man's ceremonies and man's rites and man's sanctuaries and, and all of that like this. And all the while the Bible is just further buried and buried and buried and buried under layer after layer after layer after layer after, after layer of tradition. And what really exacerbates this is that literacy rates, because books were very hard to come by, and there was no printing press and there certainly was no World Wide Web, Books are exceedingly hard to come by, so what ends up happening is, is that the church, which tended to be more of the educated people, the people that were in the upper echelons of the church, they were the ones who were basically in charge and telling everybody else what was actually right, what was actually spiritual, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have this, this, you can think of it as the loss of a religious middle class. Actually, by the way, there was also the loss of an actual middle class, but that's another story of Europe, which we won't go into right now. Basically, the, the intellectually, spiritually wealthy, right? And then you had the intellectually, spiritually poor, right? And there was no middle class. But actually, this whole situation gets so increasingly perverted. The, ch the church becomes so far gone, right? Becomes so far gone that reformers like Martin Luther and others begin to cry out for reform. Now, if Martin Luther had cried out for reform by himself in a vacuum, there would have never been any reformation. But a fascinating thing had happened just before Luther made his protestations in 1517, October 31st. A man by the name of Gutenberg had invented something called the printing press. And he, this was a remarkable convergence, providential by the way, a remarkable providential convergence of two phenomenon. Now you have three things, or you have four things that are converging. Listen to these four things. The church was a mess. You have a man who has a message, and now he has a means with which to communicate that message. And all of a sudden, Martin Luther King's book, Martin Luther King, Martin Luther's books, his books too later, many years later, Martin Luther's books begin to roll off the printing press, and guess what? Books become cheaper, access to information becomes easier, and you know what? A byproduct of all this, by the way, is not just a religious middle class, but an actual middle class. What created the middle class, and I, I'm getting slightly off base here, part of what created the middle class, that's a kind of a new concept, actually, 
is that people had access to information. So they couldn't just have the wool pulled over their eyes by the people who knew what was going on. Right? And as soon as information, as soon as books became increasingly available, you've heard the saying, knowledge is power? Of course it is. Because as soon as I can become educated, I can now think for myself and I can say, hey, that's not right, that's unacceptable, and I can rally other people around me, which is why dictators despise the middle class. Dictators want there to be a ruling elite and a low, the people at the bottom who don't get access to information and other things. But as soon as you have people that have access to data and information, now they can begin to protest against the excesses of the elite. Making sense? That's the history of the church. So the reformers begin to cry out and say, no, no, we, we, we want a change. We want a new church. We want a church that's more in harmony with Scripture. Now, against this sort of whole backdrop, we've only looked at the prophecies of Daniel, but there are other prophecies in the New Testament, and time's not going to allow us to go into too many of them, but I do want to show you one very quickly, 2 Thessalonians. This is Paul who's actually describing the very demise of the Christian church. And I want you to hear what he says, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He says um, in 1 Thessalonians, there we go, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Beginning in verse 3, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, the second coming, will not come unless the falling away comes first. That's the divorce. That's the thing we're describing right now. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. The son of perdition is the term that was used by Jesus for Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot did not oppose Jesus from outside as an opposer or as, as, a, as a violent opposer, but he betrayed from inside as a subtle imposter. Verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God, this man of sin, whoever this is, so that he, by the way, that's, that's Danielic language. He's getting this straight from the prophecies of Daniel. Now watch this. So that he, this power, this individual, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now this is remarkable. When it says that he goes into the temple of God, the whole way that Paul uses that phrase in the New Testament, the temple of God, it simply means the church. The church. You can write this down. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, where Paul says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Holy Spirit dwells in you? Right? And then in another place he says, what, what accord has the temple of God with idols? Paul, in other words, Paul doesn't use the word temple of God, that phrase, as a building. Paul is not concerned about buildings. He knows that the temple is going to be destroyed in A.D. 70. God had showed him, that, showed him that in prophetic vision. When he writes about the temple of God, what he's writing about is the church. So watch what happens. This power, he says, will go into the church, set itself up as the head of the church, and will actually try and occupy the very place and position of God. Well, that's exactly what Daniel had said. Daniel had said that it would, he would exalt himself above God, that he would speak pompous words, and lo and behold, people could be looking for a violent opposer to the church. Who's going to come and violently oppose God's church on earth? Well, it's not a violent opposition. It's a subtle imposter that comes not from outside to, to oppose, but from within to betray, like a Judas Iscariot. And so one of the great plot twists of history, again, to remind ourselves, is that the greatest enemy of the church is the church. And even to this day, even to this day, our, our Catholic friends and our Orthodox friends and our Calvinist friends and our Baptist friends and our Seventh-day Adventist friends and our Wesleyan friends, all of these churches, to greater or lesser degrees, have elements of tradition that date all the way back to the time of Constantine still in them. You might be sitting there thinking smugly, well, not my church. Oh, you want to bet? You want to bet? I would love to spend time going over your church, whatever church you, th you, know, you're, you choose to go to, and I can show you element after element after element after element of residual tradition. Now, the trick is not to have a smug sense that we're the ones that have arrived, but to have a passion to continue to grow. See, that's what happened with the Lutherans and the Calvinists and the Wesleyans and others. They kind of had the sense that, yeah, we're here, and we've arrived, and Luther had it, and we've got it, and now we've got it figured out. If you have the sense that, well, my church has it figured out, you know what you're doing? You're stopping. No, 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 no. Don't have that sense, whatever church you're a member of. No, have the sense that there's growth to be done. We need to grow closer and closer and closer to the biblical norm. We need to get closer and closer and closer to what the text of Scripture says and not become satisfied. <sighs> We've arrived. We're the ones. Oh, no, 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 no. 
We are all of us standing on the shoulders of giants. The Martin Luthers, the, the John Calvins, the, the Philip Melanchthons, the John Wesleys, the Roger Williams, the William Millers, the, the, the Joseph Bates. I mean, these are the shoulders of giants, just like you have this, this here. One, one reformer came to here, and then the next reformer to here, and then the next reformer to here. And each of those churches kind of coming out, sometimes slowly, sometimes just stopping, each one of them has, to greater or lesser degrees, elements of residual paganism and Romanism still in them. But the call, can you give me my last graphic, guys? Give me the, the graphic that goes down and up. But the call in Scripture and the promise in Scripture is that, that not only would the church be deformed. Yeah, give me the next one. They'll get it. Not only that the, that the promise is that, that the plane will take off, like this, and then it will go through a... Right? I do a pretty good plane impersonation if I do say so myself. Um, but, that that, but that plane would be recovered after an, a, a virtually catastrophic crash that God would supernaturally revive. The church was formed by Christ. It became deformed through a variety... Of, I've just painted part of the picture for you. Just part of the picture here, I've just painted part of that picture. If you want to read a great book, in fact, uh, I'm sure you can get the book by dialing some number or something that they can get you here on the screen if you're watching. You want to read a great book. It's actually the book that was responsible for my conversion, so I can recommend this book like, oh, 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 I can really recommend this one. That was good, huh? Um, <laughs> it's called The Great Controversy. And the book, The Great Controversy, details in more detail what I've just described to you right now. That, that, that the church, the church went through a period where it was formed by Christ. It became so deformed that, that people called out because what they ended up doing, what the Luthers and Calvins and others ended up doing is they looked at the medieval church and then they looked at the Bible. They looked at the medieval church and they looked at the Bible. They looked at the medieval church and they looked at the Bible and they said, huh? What? Because that, you can't get that from that. And so they started calling for reform. Hey, we got to figure some things out. The problem was is that unbeknownst to them, the church was so far gone, it couldn't be reformed. They had to start basically from scratch. And uh, in starting from scratch, the promise is that the church, and this is exactly, exactly how Revelation is depicted, that there will be a remnant, the Bible says, a remnant at the end of time who keep the commandments of God and cling to the faithfulness of Jesus. A people who will be, who, it's not that they're not denominationally affiliated, and there's nothing wrong with that, but these will be a people who are passionate about the biblical message, whatever church they're in, right? And, and people are going to increasingly, and if I was in a prophecy seminar, I'd really develop this, but there will be people who will be, who will be coming out of their own churches, some of which are absolutely saturated with, with paganism and Romanism and traditionalism, and they're just going to say, just give me the Bible. Just give, me, just give me scripture. Give me the Bible. Give me what the text says. Give me what the text says. And so my appeal to you and my appeal to our listening audience is don't get wrapped up in, a, in some version of the church. Church has to be done like this, my way. It's the only way. This is the way. But rather get wrapped up with the biblical message. 